Is it really possible to ask Jesus into your heart? Is it really possible to ask Jesus into your heart? Can you say that I asked Jesus into my heart? Is it this is this a true Bible doctrine? I I, I try to check uh, the whole of the Bible, and uh, I saw no verse <laughs> saying that you can ask Jesus into your heart. Salvation is by faith. We are told that salvation is by faith, is by trusting the atonement. You, you receive salvation by faith, by trusting. Unless you trust, you cannot be saved. How then can Christ dwell in our hearts? How can Christ dwell into our hearts? If we cannot ask him, then you can maybe tell me, Keith, then if, if we cannot ask Jesus, then how can Christ dwell in our hearts? The Bible tells us, Ephesians 1.17, uh, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So Christ can dwell, all right? He can dwell by faith, all right? So the Bible is very clear. The only way that Christ can dwell in your heart is by faith. You have to have faith so that he can dwell inside you. Salvation is not by asking, but it's by trusting. So let me, let me define this faith very well. Faith is literally, faith is also named or also called trust. All right? Or believe. These three words can be used to mean the same thing. Faith, trust, and believe. All right? You can have faith. You can say, I have faith, or I trust, or I believe. Okay? They all mean the same thing. In Romans 1.16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of uh, the power of God unto salvation. All right, the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So you have the gospel here. Gospel, and then believe. You have to believe the gospel. Okay, so we have seen something there. Then verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God, revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith, again, spoken here. The just shall live by faith. Are you a faithful person? Are you, do you have faith? Do you have faith in the gospel? We are told to believe the gospel, to have faith in the gospel. Are you doing that? So we see Jesus comes into your heart by faith in his blood. Okay, You have to have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way he can dwell inside you. He dwells by faith. He's our sacrificial lamb. The lamb of God. All right? He's our sacrificial lamb. But why is blood so important? Why is blood so important? I spoke this in another video. You can just check my other video speaking about how to be saved. I said, how important is the blood? So in Leviticus 17.11, uh, the Bible says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So once you sin, you're required to die. But then God knows that the, 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 the life of the flesh, the way you can die is by taking out your blood. So if you can die by taking out the blood, then it means then the blood is powerful as well. So what if somebody else decides, uh, I'm going to use another blood? Are you going to be saved from death? Before Jesus, God, I mean, God the Father, he gave instructions. He said that now, when you sin, according to the law, you're going to take an animal and then you're going to, you know, they used to put an hand, uh, an hand on top of uh, the lamb which they want to kill. And then the person who is sinful could uh, could cut the throat of that animal. And then as he cut, 
the the priest could be down there with a with a bowl or something and tap the blood and use that blood to go and sprinkle and put it in the altar. So as he's doing this, literally this person who is a sinner is saying, because of this blood, I know I'll be forgiven of my sins. This is the blood that you have been told which will make atonement for my sins. This is the blood. So he trusted the blood. All right? He trusted the blood. Did that sinner trust and say, Hey, little lamb, as I'm cutting you the throat, lamb, come into my heart. Is that what he was saying? No. He was trusting the blood. The blood is what he trusted. He knew that this blood which he shed is taking away my sin. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And this blood is taking away my sins. I should be the one dying, shedding my blood here. But then this blood is going to uh, cleanse my sins. But then it was not complete cleansing. It was not redemption. It was only remission of sins. The sins could go for a while and then they come back again. You know, you 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 go back home and then you uh, abuse somebody along the way. You have to go back again and then cut another throat of another animal and then that sins. So it was over and over and over and over. But that one already gives us an example and tells us how things were done. So before it was the lamb, it was the, the blood of goats, lambs, and all that. That's general animals, which were used for atonement. But now Jesus is that lamb. So right now, we know Jesus has become that lamb. He's shedding his blood for us. Jesus shed his blood. He became this lamb, all right? He shed his blood. On the cross, he shed this blood. His precious blood, which had no sin. He shed it for the sake of us, okay? So Jesus became the lamb. So he is the lamb. The lamb of God. So this lamb of God is the one which forgave us right now. Okay? And that's why even John, John the Baptist, uh, he, he declares the same. He says about Jesus uh, during the time of baptism. Let's see in John 121. The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Why was he saying the lamb of God? Because there always had to be a lamb which had to be sacrificed. So that that blood which is pouring down is the one which is cleansing you of your sins. Trusting that blood, this blood, then you know for sure that this is a blood which is supposed to be for me. Oh, sometimes I get goosebumps when I speak about this. So is the blood of Jesus more powerful than the blood of God's? Then you can ask, if there were blood, other different kinds of blood, animals, why then did Jesus have to shed his blood? How powerful was his blood? Hebrews 9, 13 to 14 tells us, it says, if for, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify them to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If the blood of lambs and goats and all those kind of things was that powerful, uh, let's assume this is, a, this is a lamb. If this lamb had a blood which was powerful to, you know, cleanse, uh, this is where the blood is poured, eh? let's assume that, eh? If it had uh, the power, this blood of a lamb, of a goat, to be able to deal with sins to a certain level, how much more do you think that the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful? It's really powerful. So what about the law? The Old uh, Testament given by Moses, that, does Jesus uh, mediate the same with the New Testament? You can ask now, what about the law? There was the law of Moses, then why are we having this other confusion here? We have been told about follow the law, follow the law. Now, how are we going to mediate this law and now the New Testament here? How, how is it going to work? Jesus giving another testament, another commandment, do this. And then uh, Moses is giving another. How, how does Jesus mediate this? How, how does it happen? Let's check. Hebrews 9, 15 to 17, it says, And for this cause... He is the mediator of the New Testament by means of death for redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, 
They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So he's mediating the Old and the New Testament through himself. Let's see verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also be necessity of the death of the testator. Jesus is the testator of the new covenant. He's the, he's the, he's the testator. We have the, new, the Old and the New Testament. We have here the Old Testament. Then we have the New Testament. So if you need to go to the New Testament, they have to be the death of the testator. Why? Verse 17, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So, if the testator is living here, then the testament is no, of no effect. But then when the testator dies, then the testament comes to life. Okay? So, how was uh, the first testament of Moses dedicated? Was there blood involved? Was there blood involved? Many people can ask. Did uh, the other testament of Moses involve any blood when he was making, when he was giving those, those laws and saying, God has said, do not do this, do not do this. Was there any blood anywhere? Let's see. Hebrews 9, 19 to 22, it says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves. Okay. And of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book, uh, all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has en uh, enjoined unto you. Okay? Uh, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by... Uh, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So without blood, <laughs> there is no remission. So in the time of the Old Testament, this lamp, this blood was used to, you know, it was sprinkled to the books after he has said, God said, do not do this. God said, do not do this. These are the laws. And re remember, there are 613 laws. People only just know the 10, the 10 commandments. No. The five first books of the Bible have 613 laws. And that's, I think, that's why Jesus just says, you know, Jesus, he says, uh, he's the end of the law to all those who believe. So when you believe, keep out the law. Actually, the law is a curse. The Bible says the law is a curse. Don't even worry about the law. Because once you're saved, once you believe Jesus Christ, he will give you the Holy Spirit. He will give you the power of the Holy Spirit such that he will guide you and tell you, don't do this, do that. Walk in this path. Don't walk in that path. Do, do, do it right. You see? So that's exactly what the Bible says. So in the Old Testament, when one sinned, he had to kill a lamb. Through the, uh, and through the shed blood of that lamb, he trusted that he would get his sins forgiven. All right. So when this lamb died and he, it was shed his blood here, this person had to believe that because of this lamb, I showed in another video, when this person who has sinned uh, had, had done something, he was the one to hold the lamb like this and then he cuts the throat of the lamb. And then when the blood is pouring down, he's looking at that blood and he's, he, as, the, as, the, as the priest is is uh, taking that blood into a, a bowl or something to go and pour it into the altar. He's looking at that blood and he's saying, I'm trusting this blood is going to be useful. It's supposed to be my own blood. It's supposed to be my own sins. Uh, it's supposed to be my own blood. But God has said, this blood will take over for my sins. So he's looking and trusting in that blood that he'll be forgiven of his sins. Did really... Where, do you think these people, when they were cutting that lamb, they could have thought and maybe said, little lamb, I want you to come into my heart. The way people try to say here, asking Jesus into your heart. Do you think somebody could say, little lamb, I want you to come into my heart? No. He trusted that blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that blood is the one which is making atonement for your souls. Everything you do right now, sinful, will be charged to your soul. Anything you do to your, through your body right now when you're alive, it will be charged to your soul. And the only way you can make atonement for that soul is through the blood. That time the blood is pouring down, you're like, I trust this blood is going to do something for me. This blood. 
And now we see very well that Jesus became the lamb. Jesus, he became the lamb of God. He is the one who became that lamb. And through him, we have been able to get forgiveness of sins. So Jesus now, you don't have to look at this lamb here. Jesus came and he said, now, instead of you dying, I will take that part. I will do it for you. You're a murderer, you're a thief, you're a pervert, you're a messed up person. You have done all the evil things that you could ever think. But it's okay. It's okay. I'll take the burden. I will do it for you. Out of love, I will do it. I don't care what it will be. I don't care the costs. I don't care how much pain I will feel. It's okay. I will do it. All you need to do is trust what I've done for you. You have to trust that blood that I shed for you. You have to trust this thing that I've done. And if you trust this blood, then you're going to be saved. You see, people try to confuse and try to bring up another gospel, which is not the truth, of asking. How can you ask? Instead of trusting, Jesus said, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Did he say, whosoever asks him into his heart, he will? No. And uh, we can ask ourselves, so if asking is, is, is not what's supposed to be done, then where does this asking doctrine come from? Where does the whole thing of ask, ask come from? It comes from the verse that I'm going to read for you here. Go, go to Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20, this is where the people who want to change the doctrine of salvation, they go there and they confuse and they take that verse and take it out of context and say, now this is asking Jesus into your heart. Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and I will sup with him and he with me. Now this verse is saying, no, Bas, I know. If you ask the door, you know, I'm standing at the door, so is they claim it's the door to your heart. Is it really the door to your heart? It's like there's a door in your heart, and then that is the door that Jesus is just standing and waiting. Let's see the context. Verse 13 and 14 gives us the context of this verse and what it actually means. Because taking a Bible verse out of context can cost you all your salvation and can send you straight to hell. Just because you took it out of context or you listened to a guy who was already deceived himself. Now, let's see. Verse 13 and 14 gives us the context. Verse uh, or that it says, uh, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. <laughs> so he's actually talking about the churches. Which church is this was being told that they, 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 they uh, you know, open the door? Verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, oh, the church of Laodiceans, this thing says the amen, the faithful true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So the church of Laodicea, it was a lukewarm church, a church where they, they are worshiping Jesus without Jesus inside. They are lukewarm. They, it's like they are doing things in their own way. They are worshiping Jesus, but Jesus is outside. They just say, hey, you know, we're worshiping Jesus, but they are doing their own things inside there. There's a lukewarm church. And Jesus is standing there and saying, hey, one of you there inside, can't you see I'm outside? You're worshiping me without me. <laughs> so you, if you have to ask Jesus into your heart, then where is the gospel? You, you see, that's the main thing that you have to ask yourself. If we are told that you are saved by the gospel, when you believe the gospel, when you're asking Jesus into your heart, where is the gospel in the first place? Have you heard the gospel? Have you believed the gospel? You see, this is the kind of uh, preachings that people just go and, yeah, today we have gone soul winning. Yeah, we're winning some people to Christ. And then you just find uh, maybe a drunkard there just having his own drinks. And then you tell him, hey, bro, you know Jesus is coming. Oh, oh that Jesus we hear on TV. Ah, okay, yeah. And he's coming to judge the world. Okay, oh, okay, fine, fine. Now, do you want to be judged? No, I don't want to be judged. So come here. Uh, I want you to ask Jesus into your heart. Say this prayer. Okay, Jesus come into my heart and he's still drunk. Has he had the gospel? Is he saved? You're damning that person to hell because he has not even had the gospel. He hasn't even known what Jesus did for him. 
He has not even known the importance of this blood and that this blood is the one which will do all cleansing of sins. He has just been told, come and repeat this. Whatever was repeating uh, and Jesus came into my heart is still drunk. Eh? And then after you go, he continues drinking. Is that person saved? Has he even understood what he has said? He has just recited a poem. The sinner prayer, asking Jesus into your heart. Don't dumb people to hell. Just tell them the gospel. All right? The true Jesus told us to believe the gospel. Could there also probably be another Jesus demanding other things? You know, if the true Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven, told us, believe the gospel and you'll be saved. Could there be another Jesus maybe who wants to be asked inside the heart? Could there be? You know, we have to really be careful and ask ourselves, could there be another Jesus maybe? Let's check. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 to 4 says, But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve. Mm-hmm. That is deception. Huh? Through, through his subtlety, so your minds could be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul is saying, <laughs> I fear the way Eve was deceived. Somebody else can come and deceive you from the simplicity which is in just believe the gospel, what Jesus said, and start telling you to do something else. Let's see verse, verse 4. For if, that, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus. Oh, there's another Jesus. There can be another Jesus, huh? Whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not, where you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. <laughs> He's saying there's some people who can come with an another, all right, eh? another. There can be another Jesus, another spirit, or you hear another gospel. Oh, so another, okay, like that. So there can be another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. No wonder these fellas try to tell people to ask Jesus into your heart. This is not the true Jesus that you're asking into your heart. Because the true Jesus told us, believe the gospel. Then this other Jesus is saying, I want to be in your heart. I want you to ask me. Not believe, ask me into your heart. Now, let me tell you something. Do you know witches speak to, to, to demons? Witches, witchcraft people, eh? they speak to demons. And they always ask them for favors, different favors, uh, maybe to do uh, something for them, you know, do this. And the, have you seen these witch doctors? Who, well, they're, they're, they're speaking, and they're speaking with demons. They are literally speaking, communicating. They can even ask a demon to possess them. And then they start doing some things. They can ask literally. And then a demon is there, ask me, ask me, and then he gets in. What if those are the kinds of things, but they're just done in a modern, more perverted, more, more good way, which looks so clean and so neat? Even the Bible tells us, there is a way that seems right to a man, but is leading to hell. <laughs> So what if these fellas, they have just changed the whole thing and uh, just from witchcraft or something else and now they want to package it in a better way of ask Jesus. Do you know there are some even some dim... I, I, had, I had a certain guy give uh, an experience of how he talked to one of these witches who changed and now they, be, you know, they got saved and all that. And he was telling him that there are some demons that they used to talk to who actually demanded to be called Jesus. What if there is just a demon who just says, hey, call me Jesus. And then you're there saying, hey, Jesus come into my heart. Pew! He gets inside. You have to be very careful about this asking thing. Because you never know, this might be another Jesus. Because the true Jesus told us to believe the gospel. And do you know why? The gospel is the good news of how Jesus died and shed his blood. That's why the demons will hear about the blood of Jesus Christ and they will run. They can stay where there is blood. If you want to scare them and you're feeling scared, I always uh, was always taught that 
Whenever you feel scared or something, always say the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus. There is nothing that is feared in the kingdom of darkness like the blood of Jesus. That's why they want to do everything else than the blood of Jesus Christ. They want to do everything else apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. And who are these people? These are people who are apostates and they are working through miracles and they are trying to say there's another way that you can get to God. You can get to heaven by doing something else apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. And these are some of the signs of the last days. All right. The Bible tells us in the last days, people will depart from the truth in the last days. Yes, we are living in the last days. We are totally, totally, totally at the end of the end of the last days. Let's see something here. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Oh, so now we have some doctrines. So you mean even devil... Satan has his own doctrines. All right. Now we understand. So we have doctrines of devils. So we thought doctrines only. We only have the Bible doctrine. So there are also other doctrines of devils. No wonder. Check. 2 Timothy 3.5. It says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Why are we told to turn away from people who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. The power is found where? In the blood. So they deny the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, but they tell you something else. But they have a form of godliness. It's like they are true. It's like they are going to heaven. We're all going to heaven. You know, there are many ways that you can go to heaven. No, no, no. You don't need to go through Christ. You can just say a prayer. You can ask Jesus into your heart. You don't need like, you know, the whole cross thing. The Bible told us very well that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. So if the message of this cross, it is the power of God unto salvation, then why are you avoiding the cross? Why are you just telling people, ask Jesus into your heart? Are you seeing the perversion? Are you seeing a very different Jesus being taught? Because Satan is trying to make his own gospel so close to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. He's trying to make his doctrine. You see, Satan is always a copycat. He wants to copy exactly what Jesus is doing. Exactly what the kingdom of God is all about. He wants to copy. That's why there's a trinity. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Satan, in the last days we are told there will be uh, the devil, the false prophet, and uh, the other guy is called what? And then the Antichrist. He's trying to make his own trinity, his own doctrine, his own things, his own gospel. Now, <laughs> let's just see. What, what, what? This is what I believe. Satan's, Satan's gospel, Satan's gospel is all about ask. All right? Ask. <laughs> ask Jesus into your heart. This is what we call the bloodless bloodless gospel is all about ask Jesus into your heart ask when you see this kind of gospel which is not this or the blood then most probably is from this guy all right but then the true God's gospel true God's gospel all right it's all about one thing Trust the atonement. All right? Is trust the atonement. This is blood-stained gospel. This is a blood-stained gospel. Are you seeing the difference? Are you seeing a difference here? There is another gospel which is totally bloodless. Don't look at the blood. The blood of Jesus is not even important. But then the true God's gospel tells us, believe the gospel. All right. The gospel is how that Jesus died. Trust the atonement, the bloodstained gospel, and you will be saved. Why are people perverting the gospel? Why are people speaking different from the gospel? Now, before I forget, actually, I was almost forgetting. What is the gospel? 
What is the true gospel? The gospel, the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And it all speaks about how that Christ died. Let me, let me just re, uh, read it here briefly. Because probably there might be someone out there who has never heard the gospel. And maybe this might be the chance that you hear the gospel and then you're saved. Listen. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So Paul tells us, now I declare unto you the gospel. Which I preached unto you, so you have to hear the gospel preached. Which you have, be, you have received, so you have to receive the gospel, receive by faith the gospel. Uh, and wherein you stand. So you have to stand in the gospel. I am standing in the gospel. I am not standing in a certain thing. I remember back in the days I used to cry and pray and say, Oh Lord, please, if you come today, just scare me. Just tell me something. that, Just show me a sign that I know you're coming. And then I can say that prayer again. I can say that prayer that I said again. I'm not sure if that prayer I did it right. Did it really did I really use the right words? Did I you see that prayer? Am I really sure about what I said? Were those words the same way the, the way they are supposed to be arranged? I trusted in a prayer. I did not trust in this until I knew the gospel, then I knew the truth. So I stood in the gospel before I was standing in a prayer. Are you seeing the difference? Verse 2, by which also you are saved, so you are saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So you have to keep in memory the gospel. It's your certificate. The Bible says, I have written my laws in you. Alright? The laws are no longer written in a tablet. They are written in us. You have to keep in memory this, the gospel. Unless you believe in vain. Believing in vain is what? You're just believing, oh, I think I'm saved because I asked Jesus in my heart. I think because I told Jesus, please come into my heart. I don't know if he really came or he never came. Jesus, did he really come into my heart? I'm not really sure if he did. Jesus, if you did not come into my heart, please, can you come again? Can you come? Maybe you left. Did, did you leave? I'm not sure if you left, but... Just come back. He's believing in vain. Instead of believing in the gospel, you're believing in something that you do. That is believing in vain. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and all those people knew the word of God. But it was in their minds. They never believed from their hearts. They believed in vain. They believed in their works. The Bible says in uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9, For by grace you're saved through faith, not of works, Lest any man should boast. Not of yourselves, not of works, not anything. Not anything you need to do. It is by faith. By faith, by grace. Grace saves you. Grace saves you through faith. You can only access the grace of God through faith. Faith in his blood. When you trust the blood of Jesus, you're saved. All right? Are you seeing the picture? Let's continue here. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Paul is telling us, I'm not giving you any other new gospel. I'm telling you what I also received from Jesus Christ. It was revealed to me by Jesus Christ. So that's what I want to give you. How that Christ died for our sins. How? How did Jesus die? How? How? This is how Jesus died. He shed his, his blood. His blood was used for us as the atonement. All right? He made an atonement for us. He shed his blood so that we can get salvation. That is how Jesus died. If there was not this blood, if, if Jesus could have died of electrocution or drowning in water or something, or being strangled, uh, you know, to death, without shedding of blood, then there could be no forgiveness of sins because there's no shedding of blood. The Bible is clear. God is a just God. He has to make sure that it happens the same way that he said. All right? Are you seeing the picture? Are you understanding it? How that Christ died, this is what saves you. Listen there. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So there are five folds here. The first one is we have to believe that Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. He died. Christ died. All right. For our sins. He did not just die for nothing. He died for our sins. He was buried. Why was he buried? He became the unleavened bread. He became sin for us. He became sin so that we can become sinless. Uh, he was buried and then he rose again. The Holy Spirit rose him. And if you believe the Holy Spirit rose Jesus, then the same Holy Spirit will also rise you in the day of the rapture or when you die. And finally, according to the scriptures. Why? The scriptures are inspired by God. If you believe the word of God, then you, it means you also believe in God. That is God the Father. He, he gave this. So it means you believe God the Son, God the Father, and uh, God, God the Holy Spirit. And you believe all these things which was, was done, was done for you. And when you trust this, remember that lamb that I was saying. When you trust that lamb shedding his blood and seeing that blood pouring down and you say, this was supposed to be my blood. This lamb is dying because of me. It is because of me that it's shedding this blood. This blood is life coming out. This is life, life going out. But now I trust because that lamb has lost his, his life. That is sin which has gone. And I trust that blood. If you can trust that blood, and you understand that concept, is the same way in here. When Jesus is at the cross shedding his blood, you just look at him shedding his blood and you say, this is the blood which could have been mine. It's the blood which could have been used for me. For me, it could be, you see, he's shedding his blood. That blood could have been me. That is life which is going out. And unless there is this blood, then I could not be forgiven. You trust that blood with all your might. And you say, that blood, since it was shed for me, then I am saved. For sure you'll be saved. Get out from this weird and wicked gospels, perverted gospels, gospels which are for asking Satan's gospels. Get away from them. Believe the gospel. Do what is right. Kindly please, if you can always help me, share the videos that somebody else might hear. Who knows, maybe. It could be the only chance that they have to hear something. God bless you. Have a great time. Thank you.